Welcome to episode 173 of your Concealed Taco Dudes podcast. <laughs> Today is just me, Taco. And me, Jason, with Concealment Solutions. I like how you turned on your radio voice. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was ramping up for this. We, I'm so excited to be here. We were sitting there just chatting about stuff, and all of a sudden, Taco got his radio voice gone. <laughs> You're going. <laughs> anyway, awesome. Let's, we're going to knock out sponsors faster than we ever have before. Okay. NOEBulletMolds.com, the best, finest makers of the finest, best bullet molds in the galaxy. Yes. Use coupon code FLT001. Save you a few bucks. Yep. Utah Air Guns at UtahAirGuns.com. All things air guns. High end, nice quality, good customer service. Go check them out for all your air gun needs. And optics. And, uh, yeah. They sell thermals, too. Yeah. They sell Night Force stuff. Yes. They're also selling Vortex now, which they haven't before. Yeah, so they sell Vortex, Athlon, uh, Night Force, and... There's a few. Hawk. Hawk yeah. And something else, but yeah. They sell a lot of nice stuff. Yep, they do. So go check them out when you use the code Air Candy. You'll get free shipping and free turret stickers. So go check them out. Black Ice Coatings at blackicecoatings.com. They have the finest gun finishes out there. So Teflon coating, Cerakoting, coating, hydro, hydro dipping. dipping. There's probably other stuff that they do that I'm not thinking of. But check them out. Follow them on social media. When you need something, call them up and tell them you want it slickery. Nice. Did, did I ever tell you about Al's? Little, it was like a, kind of this old pump action shotgun that he took to Lee. Yeah. And it was, I mean, just not, nothing nice. It was like not nice at uh -huh. all. I think it might have had the barrel even cut down a little bit. Yeah. Still legal length. Yeah. But like uh -huh. with a hacksaw. Sure. So, something like, yeah. You know, well, one of those. That's what you use. Yeah. One <laughs> of those family guns and he took it in and had Lee like tune it up and he, he got the hydro dipping, like the water transfer uh, yeah. or the, the wood water transfer print on the stock and foreign. Oh, so nice. It actually looks kind of... So the kinda... plastic stock looked like wood? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, anyways, gave it a different kind of look. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Magholder.com. Yes. The best horizontal mag carriers that exist. Yeah. And lots of other things on there. So go check them out. Use the code get in the van. I have candy and you'll save a lot. All right. Concealment Solutions at concealmentsolutions.com. Your one-stop holster shop. Also selling bushcrafting knives and other stuff. Best belts out there for carrying, EDC belts. There's a new discount code. Actually, this was Mark Housekeeper's discount code. In honor of Mark Housekeeper. And it is, how deep is your love? Nice. And true to Mark Housekeeper, it's not a normal discount code. It's like percentage. a weird percentage. It's a 17% discount. Oh, nice. So nice. Is that your sure biggest that. discount right now? It is. Sweet. Uh, it's rare if it's ever more than 15%. Used to never be more than 10%. I don't know why I'm going to 15 and 17. Yeah. Because my expenses are going up like everybody else's. But You anyway. know, I, I watched uh, that one. <clears throat> you know how I did a video of when you and I went, like, rabbit hunting with, oh, yeah. with his hawk. With Mark, yeah. And I watched that the other day. It was yeah. good times. Yeah. So if anybody wants to, you know, see what Mark looked like and when he was having fun time with his hawk, then go ahead and check out one of my old videos. And I think it's called Rabbit Hunting with a Hawk or something like that. <laughs> but, yeah. Anyways. Nice. All right. Let's jump into a news story. This right. episode is jam-packed, so we're trying to get through things so we can hit everything. But this news story I liked a lot, so we're going to make sure and hit it. This takes place in Argenta, Illinois. Argenta? Argenta. Somebody's going to write in and correct. It's pronounced Ahinta. <laughs> Something. <laughs> I don't know. Police said two fugitives who rammed a squad car and tried to flee to separate houses in the countryside near Argenta were met with the same fate. You know what? I'm not going to read that part because then it gives away the surprise. Okay. And this has got a good surprise ending. <clears throat> 
The drama began at 5.20 p.m. Tuesday when deputies responded to Casey's General Store on South North Street. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's funny to me. South, South North, North Street? Street. At least I can that's pronounce... That's like the, the East West Street? Yeah, yeah. At, at least, like, you know, it's Casey's General Store, not some weird store in Ohio. Yeah. Anyway, they received a report about a suspicious vehicle. The vehicle had previously been reported stolen to the Decatur Police Department. Both men... Decatur? Or Decatur. you mean Decatur? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Both men were still sitting in the vehicle as deputies approached it. If I don't pronounce things incorrectly, the listeners won't have anything to do. Yeah. After the episode's over. Deputies attempted to detain the males in the vehicle prior to the vehicle striking a deputy's squad car and fleeing the scene. Deputies gave chase and attempted to stop the vehicle but lost sight of it. So They went flying. They were they were High getting speed. out of town. Uh Moroa police then became involved in the search and helped with witness information. The suspect vehicle was found wrecked in a farm field near the intersection of Cemetery and Duroc Roads, north of Argenta. Deputies, with further assistance from the Oriana Police Department, so we have three police departments now yeah. involved, um, as well as the Illinois Conservation Police, then began combing the area for two men. So, there's actually four police organizations now so you have three cities and the conservation police which i don't know oh that's probably like a dnr or something like that maybe since they're out in the country yeah regardless whole bunch of cops looking for these guys deputies receive a report that that the males were outside a nearby residence seeking refuge but were met by the homeowner armed with a firearm. <laughs> One of the men fled, but the other was held at gunpoint until police could arrest him. His accomplice ran to another ear nearby residence, but was also confronted by an armed homeowner. <laughs> nice. The vigilant homeowner effectively held the offender at gunpoint, promptly calling 911. This male was also apprehended and taken into custody by law enforcement at the second location. We commend the homeowners for properly utilizing firearm training and assisting law enforcement. Nice. Which state is this in? Illinois. Whoa. Yeah. The suspects were identified... This by... is the countryside, though, right? <laughs> exactly. Like, so, okay. yeah. So it was James Snow, 34, from Urbana, and Tyler Crum, 33, of Honeyworth. Uh, Snow was booked on preliminary charges of aggravated fleeing and eluding possession of a stolen vehicle and resisting and obstructing police. He was being held in the Macon County Jail because of an outstanding parole violation. So, not a good guy. Crum was booked on preliminary charges of aggravated battery to a police officer, aggravated fleeing and eluding possession of a stolen vehicle, and resisting and obstructing a police officer. He was granted... Uh, pre-trial release with a notice to appear in court. Hmm. Whether he will do that or not is yet to be seen. But, so, again, with all the people, just call 911. Let's call 911. Four police organizations looking for these two guys, and yes. they were stopped by, by two, two armed separate armed citizens. Yeah. yeah. And, and without any violence, I might add. I wonder how no the shots fired. I wonder how the citizens knew they were criminals. Like if they saw it on the news. Or I don't think this had time to hit the news. What, how do you I think, think they would? Or do you think the people so, were like, "Let me in your house," and they're like, uh, "No." Probably somebody being suspicious. Somebody they probably saw the wrecked vehicle and these guys running from it. That's an indicator that something's not right. Right? Yeah. And both people went to the same home first. Yeah. And then, and one of them ran from that. Yeah. While the other one was Just, held at gunpoint. He ran to another house <laughs> who was met by another arm. <laughs> hey, Billy. <laughs> there's a guy coming. Yeah. Grab your shotgun. I wonder. I wonder if the that's, guy that's called. That's what I was wondering. Hey, dude, there's somebody. These guys are running. And they probably could hear police sirens and stuff going on. You know, so there's there's indicators that something 
something afoul is going on. Yeah. You know what I worry most, though, is like the like our own families, right? Mm -hmm. Our kids and our wives are probably more affected by social pressures. Mm -hmm. So like if a strange salesman comes up, yeah, I have no problem saying not interested. Go away. Yeah. My wife says that was rude. Yeah. You should, you should at least hear what they have to say. I said, Nope, Nope. I don't owe anybody anything. Yeah. And so, but if, if, if there's, and, and, you know, there was a story about some of those uh, shady salesmen, uh, was it a couple of years back, who were, like, being very aggressive and even sticking their foot in the doors. We had that. Yeah. That happened to my wife. And, and the word spread really quick down our street that this guy was coming down. And he was, like, working for, like, Xfinity or, you know, some it wasn't internet. Like- the, when when they came company. for us, like in our neighborhood, it mm-hmm. was like some cleaning supply, like yeah, magic cleaning, right? Elixir. But this this guy, yeah, my wife was being polite, not interested, shutting the door, and he stopped the door. I don't know if he put his foot in the door, his hand, or whatever. He's lucky I wasn't home because the door would have opened back up, and there would have been the barrel of a gun in his face. Because yeah. that's you can't do that. You can't. That's, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's that's yeah, not yeah. okay. Anyway, by the time he got to the end of our street, somebody had already called the police. And when they checked this guy out, he had warrants, and they arrested him. Oh, nice. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah. Well, that's that's also uh, you know this is kind of a side note, but you know a, a reason why it's good to know your neighbors and try to have open communication and relationships with your neighbors. Oh yeah, so that for sure. You can help each other out. Yeah, well, and and so you can watch out for each other. Mm-hmm. You know, I know there've been times when you know my neighbor's been out of town and you know their dogs got out or they're just not home and it's like, hey, I I rounded up your dog, you know, or what do you want me to do? They're running down the street, you know, something simple like that. But same thing, if somebody, if I'm not home and somebody that doesn't belong there is on my porch or whatever, I've got a handful of neighbors that I know are going to see it and make note of it and at least, you know, call somebody if it, if it, they feel the need. Yeah. You know, it's funny. as like you say a dog, you know, uh-huh. dog got it loose. Like when I was growing up, it was the cows. Yeah. <laughs> like, Dang it. There's a cow loose. <laughs> and my grandpa would hop on a four-wheeler and just like, rev it up and chase the cow down wrangle it (laughs) we'd all like the neighbor the neighbor kids and us we'd have to stick our arms out and kind of guide it back Mm. but it's it's when the grass would grow too tall and the electric fence would stop working oh like kind of push their way out yeah anyways (laughs) kind of those are good and bad memories yeah yeah good now but bad when it's happening super stressful yeah anyways let's jump into what we did with guns all right you go first okay so i did quite a bit uh, the other day. Me and my 14-year-old son went to the shooting range, shot quite a bit of things. I, I felt like I was shooting with you with how many guns I brought. Oh, <laughs> I I brought less than he. I want to shoot this. I want to shoot. I'm like, okay, we gotta we gotta trim it back a little bit. Fired the the AR-45 mm-hmm. pistol. I had that big stick magazine for yeah. it. Worked flawlessly. Put the short. 10 rounder that had issues if it was fully loaded not wanting to see the first round no issues so i think it was more just a break-in issue than anything the magazine being real tight yeah and uh yeah the the gun just needing to cycle a little bit yeah and so did did you ever do your coat yours in teflon yeah the whole thing the inside is that makes that so nice yeah instead of that kind of screechy sound oh yeah pulling back the it's like charging it yeah, it's just like smooth. I did that with my, I think my forty-five and my nine mil. Yeah. AR. I I really should do it with my nine mil SBR. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. I think I might have actually cleaned that finally. <laughs> it was getting kind of uh, cruddy. Yeah. Yeah. So much carbon built up. They're they're blowback designs, so they they like right. go forever without without you know needing to be cleaned. Sure. But, yeah, I was, like, scraping carbon. is crazy. Yeah. So we shot that. We shot the uh, the Kel-Tec Sub-2000, the M-Carbo Brothers 
special edition. So it's oh, got is that the one that you got from Mark? I bought from Mark, yeah, before he passed away. And, yeah, it it was great. We sh- He shot his uh, M&P 22 handgun. I brought that Browning because uh, I had issues with one of the magazines, but I didn't have them marked at the time, and I so I didn't know which You're one. You're talking about that old Browning? Like yeah. The, the weird one? The Challenger 2. Yeah. Yeah. So we've identified the culprit. What is it? It It's the magazine. Oh, okay. One of them works great, and the other one doesn't. So about just... every third round jams. Have you looked to see... <clears throat> Uh, what the differences are, like the, I, the feed lips, do I, they look about the same? or uh, I, they need to be... I looked at them before, and they did look a little bit different, but that's when I didn't have them marked, and so I didn't know which one was which yet. So oh, I need you didn't to know do which that. one was the bad one. I, need, I know which one's bad now, so I need to, to do that and figure out what's going on with that. But that made me happy that uh, I at least narrowed that down. Uh, we also shot the new dagger with that upper the one that we claimed had a horrible trigger oh yeah we need to make a correction we kind of bashed on palmetto i think you did not me a little bit with saying that their triggers were inconsistent and stuff like that now stan still has one that is a little bit weird stan's trigger that, is that, a little that weird. was a complete gun so there's something weird there yeah that, that we need to look at but mine was a lone wolf upper that i had built yeah and that was the problem because we, yeah, we swapped the after, slides right after the podcast yeah. we swapped the slides and the trigger problem jumped to the other gun yeah <laughs> and, it and followed the slide yeah it followed the slide so i actually this last week i've gone through both my daggers i've pulled them apart i did a lot of buffing and polishing and this and that and that trigger especially after shooting it on the new one that that was really crappy Mm -hmm. is i would say about 80 percent better it's still it's really smooth now but it still has a little heavy break that i don't love okay i polished up the other the full-size dagger that i've had for a while and it had a good trigger on it to begin with and and polishing everything and, and cleaning it up just smoothed it out it's i really like that trigger now oh nice and i liked it before but it made it even better yeah so that yeah, was, your green one has a. It feels good. Yeah, it feels almost as good as mine. Well, and yours has a, about a thousand more rounds, if not more than that, yeah. through it than mine does. Well, and and that's kind of interesting to note that the break in does make the trigger feel for sure for, feel better. Yeah, and so for I don't sure. know if that's like you know sp- springs wearing in a little bit, and then the could be the yeah. edges being yeah. you know. Kind just everything just... working in and settling in and everything like that. But uh, We also brought the uh, Kimber K6S, and I let him shoot that in, in 38 Special, which he's like, well, it's not so bad. I'm like, okay, let's try this now. <laughs> and we put some 357 full power loads in there, and that got his attention. He was... Yeah. He, was he getting cocky? or No. No? Okay. And I was actually really impressed with... Um, his recoil management on everything that he was shooting. He he really controlled the guns very well and, and everything, but his his thought processes are really weird. Where Welcome like, to 14-year-old oh, boys. Know. But it was like, he, he'll like ask questions, and I'm like, I don't even know how to answer that question. That question doesn't make any sense. So he, he, he fires the first round in 357, and he has this huge smile on his face, and he looks over his shoulder, and he's like... Whoa! He's like, "Is that what shooting a shotgun is like?" And I'm like, "What a handgun with yeah. a shotgun?" Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, it's like, uh, what? what it, I don't know. You can't even. That's like, it's that's like, does this it's apple like riding taste a like bike an orange? Is that what it's like to drive a car? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was like, I just looked at him. I was like, I don't even know. I mean, yeah, I, I was just stumped. I'm like, yeah, I don't understand where your brain's coming from right now. <laughs> anyway, we had a good time. And that you know, I need to get him out. Do you more, do you have shotguns? I have one. I have a Browning BPS. Okay, so that's their pump action. Uh huh. And it's it, just like their field gun. Yeah, it's the one that ejects out the bottom and loads in the bottom. Yes. Yeah. It's. I specifically was looking for something like that because I shoot left 
Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So instead of and, and ejecting out the right, right side, like everything else. Well, and if the safety's not like right up on the top, if it's if it's on the on the other side, then I can't get to the safety very easily either. So everything about that gun is beautiful. I need to shoot it more. But yeah, I, those, I those Browning BPS shotguns, <laughs> shotguns are, are cool. Yeah, that's. I think my dad had had one, and then uh, you know the old style with wood. Yep. That's what this and one is. Kind of nicked and beat up a little bit, but mine's not still nicked looks, and beat up so much. Still but. looks pretty good. Like it was yeah. his pheasant gun that he used. Yeah. So I think yeah. that would be of all the you know. It's kind of funny. My dad is actually collecting more guns now. Like yeah, me being an influence <clears throat> on him for that. Yeah. Like hey, you should get one of these. Uh, okay. You know he's he's like yeah not retired yet, but right. he could have retired. Right. But he just likes to keep busy. Sure. And so he's I just working that. a little bit less, but um, he's about to have a lot more time. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, as he's kind of picked up on his collection, then uh, he can come. When he comes to visit in Utah, then I'll be able to take him out to, to shoot. Because yeah. over in Washington, it's they used to have a lot of places to shoot, and now they're sure. housing complexes and stuff yep. like over there. And just that area has, uh, has boomed quite yeah. a bit. So. Yeah. And the laws are weird. So. Yep, for sure. So he can always bring them when he drive, and he doesn't like to fly. So he, yeah. Whenever they go from Washington to Utah, it's uh, to that's, drive. It's not a crazy long drive anyway. And he likes but. to bring stuff and take stuff. So yeah, cool. Yeah. Anyways, so other than that, um, I had him shoot my 365, like the small how, one. How did he like that? He and. This was spurred from a, a previous weird conversation that I had with him, where he was asking me about which gun has more recoil, this one or you know a nine oh, millimeter, yeah. and I'm like, well, why don't you shoot? <laughs> it's not. It, it's you can't. Just, that's not a blanket question that you can just answer. What you know? What mm-hmm. type of gun are you shooting it out of? And so and I had the him, load. I mean, right. it gets even crazy. Oh yeah, like, yeah. The load. The so he shot the everything. he shot the three sixty five, and then he shot the dagger. And and could tell the difference between a full well, it's not full size, but almost you know Glock 19 size basically versus a, a micro compact nine that is very controllable, I might say. Yeah, um, he liked them both, but he he liked the bigger frame guns better. You want to know what his favorite gun was? The revolver? Nope, the Browning. That the little twenty two. The little twenty two. That thing has the most amazing trigger on it. Huh. I was shocked. I, I I guess with all my and that's a little semi-auto, right? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's like it's the predecessor to, to the, the Buckmark. Okay. It was incredible. The trigger on that gun. So and, and so is that one all fixed up? That's the one that yeah. you had problems with. And yeah, Gene Dean helped. sleeved it, resleeved the barrel, and and yeah. The the one that was going to be a sweet deal that only needed a couple little parts that yeah. ended up needing a lot, <laughs> but. It's and and he just liked he could tell that it was an older gun, it was it was bigger and heavier. He liked the wood grips with it's got the old school Browning logo, just the the B I think it mm-hmm. is, you know, a little medallion in the grips, and so that was kind of cool that he he liked the old stuff. He appreciated it, which I thought was cool. Yeah, that's, most of that's what cool. I have is. Now, combat Tupperware. But you haven't exciting... you haven't taken him out to shoot the old one, like the hundred year old gun, right? No, that's we need to do that. Yeah, I haven't shot that one yet. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see because you just have the iron sights on it, right? Yep. And uh, I, that's where I'm going to keep it. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if it shoots like according to the sights or if right, you know. And I'm not sure on that one. I believe the the front sight is dovetailed in. Is the front sight adjustable? I can't remember. Like to be honest. when I say adjustable, I'm air quoting because it's not. You'd have to like You're banging push it. on it with a yeah, you yeah. tap or or push right, with the right. sight tool. Yeah. So anyway, but, that's that's what I did with guns. What did you do? Okay, I'll I'll, I'll try and keep it kind of short because <laughs> we we have a lot of the topic we want to talk right. about. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I did was I picked up these kind of like ammo cases oh they're like kind of big they're the M- mtn or m is it is it mtn it's M- i thought it was mts 
I don't know, the Case Guard M- ones. MTM Case Guard. Yeah. yeah. So They make lots of plastic boxes. And they stuff. make a lot of handy ones that I like to put, yeah. like the more, you know, my ammo that I am hand loading for specific purposes. Right. Uh, rifle stuff, I, I really like their cases. Anyways, I got their big case, and supposedly it holds, it can carry like 45 pounds or something. Yeah. So If you fill gonna, that with ammo, it's going to weigh more than 45 pounds. <laughs> well, what I was thinking about doing is using it to store 22 ammo, and then I got mm. another one for like shotgun ammo. Oh, okay. And so then I can just grab the whole bin. Yeah. And stuff. But sure. Anyways, so I got those. Uh, I also, I have taken the plunge into shot shell reloading. I've yes. avoided it for so long because <laughs> I... And how did you decide to get into that? Actually, it's kind of funny. So you brought a press. So I, I brought two, two presses. So I have to tell this story. Okay. The car dealership next to me, there's several. Actually, the one has gone. The, the car dealership, the if annoying you've come, one to my dealer, or come to my shop and have struggled with the, the parking lot being crowded and everything, that problem is gone. So there's another car dealership on the other side of me, run by this guy from Peru. His name's Luis. Super cool guy. He came walking into my shop one day, and he's holding this little 1911 up over his head. <laughs> and I'm like, what the crap? I'm like, Luis, what do you got? Here, here. And I'm like, I come over and he's like, here, this, this was in a car. It's not for me. It's for you. <laughs> what? It was a BB gun. Okay. <laughs> the BB gun spray painted black. Oh. And I was like, oh, I'm like, okay. You know, I thought maybe I could use it for a display or something on one of my mannequins or whatever. And I just threw it in the garbage. It was a total piece of crap. That's that's and too bad. It was not like a real. I know. I was excited. <laughs> he, he would have been. He would have been okay giving you a real nineteen eleven. I probably. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, but he's like. I'm like. Oh, I said the guys probably were you know, gangbangers or something. He's like. Yeah. He's like. There are a whole bunch of cell phones too. He's like. I don't understand. He's like. I'm sure they were robbers. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah, they were robbers. They probably were. The next day. Same thing. He comes walking into my shop, and he's holding this half-set-up reloading press by the handle. He's like, what's this? Is it for bullets? And I'm like, yeah, that's a reloading press. It's not for me. It's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. I'm like, where did you get it? In that same car? And I'm like, what? Yeah. So weird. So basically what we've learned is that you are a terrorist, because you're teaching all these gangbangers how to reload. How to reload? <laughs> Well, that was a shot shell press. I know. <laughs> anyway, I uh, so I brought you that one. A week later, I got one that was uh, it was Mark's. You know, his wife is kind of getting rid of some of the stuff that's laying around, and and that one was a little more complete. But yeah, so you have two. And shot now shell I have presses. four. Now you have four. Yes. <laughs> Did you buy some? Yes. <laughs> So when I said I decided to take the plunge, like, yeah, you went head I did first, it head first, <laughs> traditional like taco style. Yes. Uh-huh. So, anyways, I because I wanted to have two of the I bought one of the presses which was it's called the Slugger. Okay. And it's it's set up to make slugs. Okay. And do like roll cramps. Yeah. And so. I wanted a press that was kind of dedicated to doing that because that's more along the lines of what I want to do is load slugs okay. and buckshot. Okay. And so, and I was also able to convince a, a, a friend to split the cost on the slugger press. Oh, there you go. And so because he split the cost with that on me, uh, then I decided to pick up a, one of those Mech Juniors, like, complete. So okay. I know what... Yeah. is supposed to be there and uh-huh. then i figured with the knowledge of that and the instruction manual all that stuff right then i could complete the other two presses the one is yeah. kind of it needs some 10 tlc the the one that came out of the gangster out of the, car yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah it yeah. was it was rough it's so i'll, I'll need to you know everything it still moved it freely, still moves which otherwise which, i'd have just thrown it in the garbage yeah but. so i'm I'm gonna need to give it a little TLC. Yeah. Remove a little rust and yeah. Shine it up, but I'll do that after I figure out how to use right. it. Right. Because then and I think needs. it's th- those two other presses are older uh, versions of the Mech 
junior, okay. like a 600 junior. So, and I guess I should check to make sure that they're 12 gauges, but... Yeah. Yeah. I would assume they're 12, but, you know, maybe one of them's a 20. Who knows? Who knows? So... It'll be 410. Yeah. No, 410 <laughs> would be... Everything would be tiny. Yeah. But I decided, you know, that's... You know, I got that mold from it, from Al, from NOE, uh -huh. the big pellet-looking mold. Uh-huh. And so it casts these big old slugs that are shaped like air gun pellets. <laughs> and uh, so I, I got that, and then getting a couple other molds for Buckshot and... There's one company that makes one. It's just a giant round ball. Yeah. That a 12 gauge round ball. So. So it's like a big. So it's it's like a. A 80, marble, like 80, a big 80 cal's muzzle loader. <laughs> yeah, or whatever shotgun is like 72 cal or, or whatever. something. It's big. And so I I of course got one of those coming. I wonder how what accuracy is going to be like with something like oh, that. Oh, I don't know. I mean, you 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 have. You, to think that it would be similar to like the old flintlocks and stuff like that, the smooth bore, yeah, a, it's a ball. I mean, yeah, and huh. the other thing I want to do is play around with some. So, for those of you who don't know, I like shooting shotguns, I just don't do it very often, or I haven't traditionally shot shotguns very much. Yeah, when I do, you know, it seems like we go throw some clays and I blast them, have a good time, yeah, and I don't do it for another six months or a year, yeah. And that has been like the trend. So when someone, a friend says, hey, you want to go shooting? We always think rifles, pistols. Right. So with the last big splurge on shotguns, the Turkinellis, the Turkish made <laughs> Benelli clones, uh -huh. then I, I thought, well, it would be cool to be able to, you know, if I'm shooting semi-autos and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I could take those when we're shooting rifles or pistols and then shoot a bunch of slugs. Yeah. And so... Anyways, diving into that, I'm cool. realizing, though, that shotgun reloading, it kind of sucks compared to, like, metallic reloading. Yeah. Metallic reloading, you can substitute parts all the time, like, and then there's ranges of powder, uh, you know. Right. Like, you can use 12 different powders for this bullet, uh -huh. and then here's the minimum and maximum. Right. Right, so you could use all that. Right. With shot shell reloading, what I'm learning is that you use, you're supposed to use low data that exists right because uh, otherwise if you change something up it can blow up your gun or whatever yeah and so they give you recipes of the projectile the wad the hole so it's less like, experimental which is what you like yes and i think it could probably be more experimental later yeah but as an as a newbie yeah it's not like I'm going to jump in. It's I, just I gotta, like cooking. you got to start with a recipe, and yeah. then you can start tweaking it yourself and after you've played yeah, with it. Yeah, and there's different... The different holes have different... Everything's different about them. Yeah. And so some of them have a longer uh, brass case, I guess, the, yeah. the, the, bottom, the bottom, the base, and then how they're constructed, the plastics they use. And I did order some of the brass casings, the 12-gauge brass. yeah. And so but, how does it, can you, can you reload a spent shotgun case? Like does, is a plastic reusable and all that kind of stuff? Or are you having to replace parts of the case or just do new? I, yeah. So this, these are all questions that all questions I'm like, that you have. I have been staying up late reading a lot and watching videos. Okay. And there's a channel on YouTube called Manny CA. Yeah. And he does, he lives in California and he does a lot of reloading stuff, casting stuff. And he reloaded these one shells, shot, shot shells, like way past what I would think would be like okay to do. Yeah. I mean, they were like cracked and, uh, the, the mouths, but he's like, okay. as long as it crimps and it holds the BBs in, then you can fire it. And so he, he did it like 11 times huh. or something. He's comparing an old hole and a newer hole of the same type. Interesting. So, anyway, okay. anyways, I'm learning a lot, and I don't presume to know much right now. Right. Just that load data is your friend, and yeah. <laughs> with all the different brands, and now there's like the Chedite stuff that's, I think it's from France. Huh. So, just primers and availability and component availability. I don't think there's a lot of people loading shot shells yeah. now, and not as much as used to. Huh. And so I went to Sportsman's, picked up some wads 
I just grabbed one of each kind that they had. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that I would have, I'm trying to just acquire a lot of different things. So sure. then when I get all the different load, man- and I've ordered like four, four load manuals. manuals. <laughs> yeah. So then I can have as much load data so that I could probably find a few loads that I can actually do. Yeah. It, it gets tricky that way. And me not knowing what's able to substitute with what, yeah. then I got to stick with the loads first. So. Yeah. So besides that, I was going to say, tell us about that shotgun sitting over your shoulder. So I I can't remember if we mentioned this one last episode, but this is, I have in my hand, the Turcanelli. It's a (laughs) Panzer Arms M4, and it looks pretty nice, It does. It looks really nice. So I ordered from Palmetto, because they had it in stock. It's the nickel-coated one. It's their uh, Marine. They call it the Marine, because it's got that nickel coating more weatherproof yeah and i i don't love pistol grips on shotguns yeah and especially like the benelli ones that's i've always hated the length of pull and the pistol grip on the m4 Uh uh-huh and so i saw that they sell the aftermarket turkish walnut traditional style stock and forend so i ordered those and uh replaced the the plastic the plastic you know, pistol grip and stuff. Uh And it actually looks really nice. It does. I I would not have thought that traditional wood on that nickel would have looked nice, but it really does. Yeah. So I got that all set up. I I like the sights. Got the Yeah, it's it's got a rail and ghost ring sights. Yeah. I'm debating on putting a little hollow sun on there or something. Like a pistol red dot. Yeah. And because if I'm shooting slugs in the uh, buckshot, then having a sight, you know, would be kind of nice, a red dot. Yeah. So got that all done. I did go shooting. And the funny thing is uh, it was like raining like crazy. Yeah. And so uh, that was before the M4 arrived. So I wasn't able to, you know, fire that yet. Yeah. But I did break out my old, my old Saiga 12 the 24 inch barrel and I was busting clays with that. Nice. It was fun. It reminded me like why I enjoy shotguns. Yeah. And then I I took the lever the lever gun 12 gauge oh, nice. made by Panzer. How did you like it? I was shooting and hitting clays. Nice. So my friend who went who went with, he ended up ordering a new clay thrower. Oh, okay. And uh supposedly it's it's kind of cool cuz it's like a foot pedal, but it doesn't require like a battery or anything. Oh, okay. And so it has a reservoir. You fill it up on top, and then you like hit the pedal like twice. So I think yeah, once so cocks, it, cocks it, it, and then you and then once it. releases. Cool. So as fast as you could stomp the pedal, I guess you could really little, send them out. A little launch two at a time, or just single. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. So cool. He just barely got it. We haven't tried yeah. it out. So that's what I want to do is. And, you know, maybe I'll load some regular birdshot bird type shot? Yeah, yeah, for clay loads. That stuff's, well, I haven't bought it in a long time. I was going to say it's super It's about, cheap, like, but... $9 for a box now, yeah. 9 to 10 Hmm. So it's not cheap like it used to be, where it's, like, 5 bucks a box. Yeah, So same as everything anymore. I'll have to do the calculations <clears throat> and see if it's worth if it. If it's worth it, yeah. And then also if I can figure out a way to build my own shot maker you know then i could if i can make my own shot then that would reduce the cost of reloading the shot shells like immensely yeah so but for now i think it'll probably be just uh, i might load some regular ones just to get some practice and experience but slugs and buckshot is what i want to do yeah so cool yeah i did a bunch of 10 millimeter reloading and some other stuff and but Let's dive into our topic. Yes. So we are finally getting around to our gun purchase stories and listener feedback from that. So why don't you go ahead and get into the first one there? Okay. This first one is from Rod. And he says, hello, concealed taco dudes. And by dudes, I mean whoever is in the studio. (laughs) This happened back around 2014. A friend and I were talking rifle calibers and i told him i was interested in a 6.5 creedmoor and he said he thought the 6.5 x 55 was still the best of all the 6.5 cartridges he said 
He no longer had his 6.5x55 rifle, but if I was interested, he would give me all he had left of his 6.5x55 reloading dies, loaded ammo, and components. So if he thinks it's the greatest one, why is he getting rid of everything? Because he doesn't have the gun? Yeah, uh, probably, I don't know, sold the gun. and I made that mistake once, too. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all have. Anyway. He says, uh, I was on that deal like a bum on a bologna sandwich. <laughs> so I acquired all his stuff, and the hunt was on for a rifle. I looked around and went to one of the older gun shops in the area that had lots of used guns. I asked if they had... Any rifles in 6.5x55? And the clerk says, I think we have one back here somewhere. Oh, perfect. If it's in a dusty corner, that's even better. Yeah. He dug around and came back with a sporterized Swedish Mauser. Nice. That's kind of what you got. Yeah. It was made in 1915. It had nice. a Bushnell 3-9 to scope mounted on it with a sling. The bore was bright and clean. The tag on the trigger guard had 239 bucks. Wow. Needless to say, I still have it. I think I still think someday I might get a creed more, but this old Mauser shoots well and scratches my six five itch. I have been a long time listener to the podcast through all of its evolutions. My therapy wow. bill will be forthcoming. <laughs> all the best, Rod. Nice. Did he say what like year or time frame that he got that? Yeah, he said twenty fourteen. Oh, okay. So that's nice. uh <clears throat> yeah, for th those 6.5x55s, the Swedish Mausers, they're becoming harder and harder yeah. to find. A lot of that that uh, war surplus stuff is really getting yes. hard. I mean, 10 years ago, there there was lots of stuff. You had options. Yeah, fact, even I noticed even on Gunbroker, like, I'm not finding all the crazy yeah. stuff I used to find. Yeah, even, so like, at one point in time, I, I thought, oh, you know, an old Walther P-38, mm -hmm. kind of an ugly, dorky gun, but it's a military gun, right? It's got some history, and I thought way back when, and they were like, you could pick them up for a couple hundred bucks, you know? And I thought, oh, someday I'll, I'll grab one. Yeah, not anymore. You know, yeah. you can't find them anywhere near that when you can find them. Yeah, the other <clears throat> thing, too, is like, I think I'm at that point with like an SKS, yeah, I I've owned SKSs in the past and sold them. Uh huh. And I sold them for kind of different reasons. Like I was trying to make my SKS more like an AK, uh, and then I realized the AK just does everything better. Right. But then now I want an SKS for an SKS. Right. To use the stripper clips and yep. you know have that nice non rattly stock and yeah. And well, after we get through these, I'll tell you my SKS story because it's applicable. Uh, greetings from Alabama. Many years ago, I was working, volunteering at a gun shop that a friend of mine ran. We had a little old lady walk in with this old bolt gun. She said the gun, she laid the gun on the counter and told my friend, I want to sell this gun. How much will you give me for it? He looked it over, recognized what it was and told her, ma'am, I can't give you what this gun is worth. If you sell it yourself, you can get a lot more for it. She looked at him and said, that's not what I asked. How much will you give me for it? He reached in his pocket, pulled out $200 cash he had on him and said, this is what I have right now. She gladly took the $200 and said, thank you. You, I don't know where this is going, but you're bad people. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? They're, they're honorable men helping an old lady. She then proceeded to tell us a story. My husband passed away several years ago, and I don't want the gun in my house. He was a soldier in World War II and got this gun on one of the islands he, had, he was fighting on and brought it home as a war trophy. The good old days, man, when you oh, could man. bring home war trophies of firearms. She th then said, thank you, put the money in her purse, and left. Me and my friend stood there admiring the weapon, and after doing some research, found out it was a Type 99 Arasaka nice. in 7.7 .7 Jap. That still had the chrysanthemum intact. The, oh, nice. The rattle cover over the bolt, the anti-aircraft sights were still on the adjustable rear sliding sight. It had the bayonet and cover, and all the arsenal marks matched. 
Oh, dang. Dang. That's awesome. Yeah. The rear of the bolt even has the rising sun on it, so we know it was produced early in the war because as the war drug on, they were running out of materials in time they started and time and they started to just weld the rear of the bolt the wood has a few small nicks here and there but no major damage um, at all the gun is in pristine condition as soon as i saw it i fell in love with it because i love a piece of history and this gun truly was a piece of history You've got some of the old yeah, Japanese. Yeah, I've got I've got one of the six five um, Japanese and the yeah. seven seven. And getting them with all those markings and matching serial numbers that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, at the time, this being close to twenty years ago, knowing it was worth more than I had at the time, I told my friend I couldn't possibly pay you what it's worth, and he asked me what did I have to trade for it. And I happened to have a Glock 26 at the time that he was actually interested in, and he agreed to an even trade. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh! <laughs> All these oh, years that's, later, that's so awesome. It it is still one of my most prized safe queens, sitting next to my pristine Springfield Arsenal M1 Garand post-war production, also with matching period correct bayonet. I am proud to own both of these pieces of history. I wish I could find some more provenance on the last soldier the Arasaka was issued to, but I don't know if that's even possible. And I do need to bring the old geisha back to life and reload some ammo for the 7.7 because I did manage to find a handful of brass. Cool. Chris B. Love the show. Just got caught up recently. Hope oh, okay. P.S. He says, Who knew... Close to 100 years later, that some fat redneck from Alabama would have the rifle that uh, some Japanese factory worker put together to send off to war. Yeah. That's a cool story. That's kind of what we were looking for, stuff like that. Yeah, I know. That's, that's cool. The, yeah. That's that's one thing about those... The Japanese stuff is, is, I think, a lot more rare than a lot of the European stuff that we've seen. Yeah. I don't know. I think all of it's just getting harder and harder to find. Yeah. And I think as... Maybe the Japanese stuff just wasn't as popular because of the, they had some odd well, calibers and stuff like fir- that. Yeah. So at first, the the Japanese... Everybody thought that the Japanese manufacturing was poor quality. Right. You know, being the enemy and right. you know stuff. And it turned out that, you know, they they did some pressure testing and stuff they, and they found kinda, out it was They kind of knew like, what they were doing. Yeah, they are making really nice, strong actions. Yeah, and so yeah. Anyways, that those those Japanese rifles are awesome. I I have a couple, and that that sounds like you you got real lucky on that one. Yeah, and and that's kind of how those military rifles go, though. Is you have to be in the right place, yep. the right time, and have the right amount of money. Yep, yep. And you, you've got to be ready to act. Yeah, Gene, he helped me find. Fine, and that's what I was doing. Is I was just spreading the word. Hey, I'm looking for a Japanese. Yeah, Arasaka. I remember that. And so, if you see one, let me know. And, yeah. And well, and Gene's always in the right place. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's he's always in the right place, talking to the right people. Yeah. And he comes across some crazy stuff. So. Yeah. Anyways, you got another one? Yes. This one is from Nate D. Nady. Nady, and he says, "Hi, concealed taco dudes." You asked for more gun deal stories, so here you go. Like I said in my last email to you, good deals have a way to f- of finding me. Wow. This guy they is don't a meet. lucky dude. I think they're good deals, and then they end up costing me more to fix them. Yeah, so he says, Jason, you asked for my SKS stories. Oh, yeah. This is the story that started the whole thing. Yeah. Right before Thanksgiving, my buddy, this- work wife from a previous store, <laughs> tells me he was looking... On KSL classified under antiques and came across someone selling an SKS, he had it listed as non-functioning display only. As my buddy and I were talking about it, we we were wondering, what's non-functioning, like air quotes, right. uh, about it? After looking at replacing parts, I decided it was totally worth it for the price they were asking at 200 I reached out to the seller and asked what not, what was non-functioning about the rifle. He said he had never shot it and it and wasn't sure if it functioned or not. Oh, so he said he also said that he had a list of had it listed that way so he could put it on KSL. Oh, 
Oh, because you they won't let you sell guns on KSL yeah. anymore. For those what? of you who not know, KSL is local online classified ads here in Utah. Yeah, they used to be the main yeah. place to buy, sell, trade guns. Yep. When we m- met up, he said he thought it was a Russian SKS based on the fact that it says 762 by 39 Russian on the barrel. I wasn't sure how to decipher the markings on the receiver, and that time... Uh, to know for sure where it came from. The guy was more than happy with his asking price of $200. Yeah. After getting the rifle home and looking into the markings on the receiver, I have determined it is a 1954 Russian SKS from the... Is, I don't even know how to yeah. say it. Yeah. Factory. From what I can tell, it um, has been referred that it was a light refurb and is in super good condition with very low count round counts through it. I have taken it out and shot it, and wow, it runs great. I love this piece of history. Nice. That is cool. Yeah. And then he has another one. He says... This is Nathan, right? Nate D. Yeah. yeah. He he was in the shop, told me that story. That's what inspired me to oh, okay. get this. I thought that would be a good topic. So thanks for sharing with everybody, Nathan. And you got another one. Yeah, he says, several years ago in the Obama years, oh, <laughs> those were crazy. Yeah. Because the way things were, the panic buys, that's when all those yeah. panic buys, and mm-hmm. like, you could sell an AR for like, I don't know, 2000 2000 bucks, yeah. that was worth 400 <laughs> Yeah, he says, when we were having crazy talks about mass shootings, I was in a church, and somehow gun safe, guns and safety came up. So I got on my soapbox something about protecting yourself and family. I really don't know what I said. After class, this gentleman came up to me and thanked me for what I said, and he agreed with me. This started a friendship. One day when we were out shooting, he told me he had a few guns he had uh, never shot before. Hmm. One of the guns he pulled out was a CZ-85B. Those are cool. Okay. My eye got really big as I told him, uh, you have the real version of my EAA witness. I gave it a good cleaning and some oil. A few months later, Rick comes up to me after church and tells me that he wants me to have the CZ. What? <laughs> he said it's sat in the safe for years and he's never shot it and he knows I would enjoy it. That CZ is still one of my favorites. Wow. See, I tell you I'll be nice to people. That's what happens when you're nice to people. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've, I've had that happen, too, before where I was, you know, everybody knows I like guns. And yeah. then this one guy, he just says, hey, I I know you like guns. I have this little rifle. Haven't shot it, you know, forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can have it. Wow. It's a little 1022. Nice. So, that, you know. Cool. That kind of stuff does happen sometimes to yeah. some people. You got to be does. lucky. Apparently, I still have bad karma from a previous life. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay, here's another one. Oh, it's actually two. He said, I have two for you. One was a good deal, and the other was a great find. The first one was during the Magpul panic of 2012-2013, when a run on their mags during the post-Sandy Hook buying panic coincided with them shutting down and leaving Colorado due to its new mag restrictions. Oh, yeah. Yep, I, I remember, remember that. that. Yep, they are now Mag, Mag Pool P Mags were selling for like fifty bucks. Yeah, I crazy. made a killing off of I, them. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> you did. Well, I I would never sell anything that I thought would be valuable and I should keep. Right. I just thought people were crazy, and yeah. that you know, and I did keep some of my aluminum mags. Yeah. So and a, a couple P Mags, but yeah. Right. Anyways, he said I had a couple of ARs at at that point, and I was told by people. I trusted that I should have a bunch of mags for them. I bought a 20 pack on sale and they and then another 10 to 12 individually as they were available at a good price. Average price was probably 10 bucks each. So yeah, that's yeah. that's about right. During the panic a Ruger 44 Magnum carbine popped up on a local classified site. I'd always wanted one but was but he was asking 650, which is a little more than I could do right then. Instead of cash we worked out a deal where i gave him the 20 pack in exchange for the gun oh what? What? <laughs> oh i got the crazy. gun for 200 bucks <laughs> <laughs> and he flipped the mags for 800 on the same classified site the next day 
So that's, they both made so out. So they both made a killing. That's awesome. <laughs> that's so funny. That's pretty great. Whoever bought those mags was an idiot. They lost. Yeah, yeah. The second one was due to me hanging out at bars. I was a regular at a, at a place right down the road from the range I used to go to. I used to talk guns with the folks there and even arranged a few range trips for other regulars and some of the staff. One day the cook asked me what I thought he could get for a few guns. He was having car trouble and needed some cash. We went out to the parking lot and he showed me three different pistols. The first was a Gen 1 Glock. Okay, that's kind of cool. I think uh, owning a Gen 1 Glock would be cool nowadays. I do, Just too. because of the collector. Yeah. Not like it's... The history it's, of Yeah, it. not like it's like a collector collector. It's, like, ooh, look at this old World War II rifle. It, it's kind of like a... But just, at some point, it will get to that yeah, point. It's like, this is a Gen 1 yeah. first edition Glock. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the second was a very old Smith revolver. And the third was a more modern Smith in 38, 357. I told him the Glock was probably worth the most. Maybe, I don't know. But he wanted to keep that. Uh, when, he looked at the an- when we looked at the antique Smith, I had to break the news that the old guns don't mean rare guns. True. Yes. It was an older caliber and was probably only worth a couple hundred as a curiosity. Uh, the new Smith b- baffled me a bit because it didn't have a model number on the cylinder yoke. I took some pictures and told him I would look it up. He told me a pawn shop offered him 600 for it, but I uh, convinced him to wait a day and let me see if that was reasonable. If a pawn shop's offering you 600 bucks, it's, it's probably, probably worth, worth a lot. 12. <laughs> yeah, at least. Yeah. It's like I worked... Worked on it overnight and went by the bar the next day with the good news. He had an original Smith & Wesson registered Magnum. The first gun chambers chambered for the 357 and probably one of the finest pistols Smith & Wesson has ever produced. I told him that it was probably worth four to 5000 on the open market, oh, but geez. he needed cash right then, so we made a deal where I got it for 3500 what a nice guy! Wow, that's a nice yeah, that's a nice guy right there. I sent I I it's still, I would I would have said I'll give you seven. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I sent all the info to Smith and got a jinx letter that detailed the history of the gun. It had been sold to an FBI agent in Ohio, who ended up as the agent in charge of the Cleveland office. That made sense because the Cook's family moved here from that area, and he said his dad picked up all these guns at local pawn shops back there. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting that an FBI agent would pawn his gun. Or was it stolen and somebody pawned it? Uh, One wonders. The gun was in exactly the same configuration as it left the factory, and while it does have some honest wear overall it's in great condition i still have it and it's one of the guns i show off the most i'm attaching a picture so you can see for yourselves uh thanks for the great show Uh, spencer in smyrna oh nice cool that's that's cool that's do you have another story yeah okay i'm gonna share my sks story when you're done okay i've got a couple short ones okay so this this one's from uh, Nate D again because okay. we told because he he says I got a lot of stories. Do you want me to send? Them? I said send them all. Nice. So this one is, says the last Black Friday Cabela's had a Ruger 1022 on sale for 259 or something close to that. I was looking at what I had in Cabela's points. I ha- had almost enough to pay for it, almost, and just needed a little for tax. So why not? Sure. Then Sportsman's Warehouse had a SIG 3-9 scope on Black Friday sale. Once again, I almost had enough to pay for the scope and rings and points. They also had an extra 15% off code. I was able to put the full package together for a total of $29.12 <laughs> out of pocket. Nice. You know, I used to do the same thing. Yeah. I had a Cabela's credit card. Uh-huh. And I would... This was like... I think they got wind of what i was doing or something you probably weren't the only one doing it yeah either, but but i was stacking points with they would come out with these vouchers like uh and they kept getting smaller and smaller as uh-huh. cabela's time went on yeah but it would be like 
what was it, uh, like a hundred bucks off $500 purchase, something like that, right? And so I I bring in my points, the voucher card, and then a coupon code for like a certain percentage off. Wow. And I was buying like gun like guns for like really cheap. Huh. And the when you know when I say oh can I use this too and they're like uh oh okay you know at the, <laughs> when you go to pay for the gun yeah and then they're like oh and you have points do you want to use those too? <laughs> why yes, uh, why I do. yes I do. <laughs> I remember walking out with a couple handguns, you know, for like a hundred dollars each. Wow! And yeah, anyways, but then they—I think they just kind of wisened up about the, yeah. the stacking and made sure that they didn't have the coupon codes go at the same time as those right. voucher cards. And yeah. anyways, but yeah, that was one way to really huh. get stuff cheap. You got one more? Yeah. All right. I was nonchalantly looking for a thirty carbine. Okay. Those are awesome. Yeah. One day, my work wife the guy you spend 50 hours a week with and is your bestie told me his girlfriend was getting ready to move and she was going through her deceased husband's firearms and just so happened to have an auto uh ordinance uh, 30 carbine nice all i was able to offer was pre-covid price and that was all i had at the time despite having an offer four hundred dollars more than mine she said she'd sell it to me wow then when she was moving she came across four 30 cal ammo cans with about 1300 plus rounds of 30 carbine with a bunch of 10, 20, and 30 round magazines for it. She sent them all home with me even after I said I can't give you anything for them. She said, they are mine. Cool. This is one still one of my favorite guns to shoot. Nice. That, man, the ammo is worth more than what he, probably what he paid for the, right. the, the gun. Right. That's so, cool. Right, so You got a story? So, years ago, I bought a Smith & Wesson Sigma. Oh, yeah. yeah. They were super cheap at Gunnies. They had, they had a deal where you could get it for 300 bucks, and there was a $50 rebate. <laughs> or 300 bucks, and you could, they would send you two extra magazines. Uh-huh. And so I got the two extra magazines, I think. I'm pretty sure that's what I did. Yeah. Anyway, this was a long time ago. I shot that gun a lot. I shot IDPA matches with it and everything in spite of its horrible trigger. I mean, it's bad even by Smith & Wesson standards. Yeah. Really bad. Super reliable gun, but just a horrible trigger. I, I put at least 1,000, if not 2,000 rounds through it. Okay. And I decided I was moving on to something that was better. And I listed it on KSL back when we could... I don't remember what I listed it for, but a guy responded, which typically when you list some, a gun for sale, the first people to respond want you to trade. Mm -hmm. Almost always. Hey, we are you open to trades? And I was like, eh, what do you got? And I, I didn't really want to trade, but I'm like, what do you got? And he's like, I have an SKS. And I was like, okay, I'll take a look. And I just assumed it was going to be like a piece of crap. Chinese yeah, yeah. SKS because I don't know what I was asking for this gun. Probably a couple hundred bucks, maybe three hundred with extra gear and stuff like that. And so we meet, we show up. He, I hand him the gun. He hands me this SKS, and he's like field stripping the gun and going through everything. I'm looking at this SKS, and I'm like, this is Yugoslavian, and there's still Cosmoline in all the nooks and crannies. Yeah, I don't know that this has been shot much, if at all. There wasn't a nick or scratch in the stock. I mean, this thing looked brand new. Oh, nice. And, and it had the the grenade launcher sights, you know, and the, and the big old muzzle device for the grenade launcher. Had the bayonet attached. Everything was there. And I'm like, okay, let's just see how this is going to go. You know, I, I've already decided I kind of want this SKS. This, mm -hmm. is, this is pretty cool. And uh, he's like, yeah, okay, yeah, this is great. He's like, so are, are we good? I'm like... We're just trading straight across. He's like, yeah, if you're okay with that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. For a Sigma? Yeah, I guess I'll do that for, for you because I like you. <laughs> for you, I give good deal. <laughs> I, I probably could have told him, uh, you're going to have to throw in 50 bucks. And he probably would have done it. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, sweet, yeah, I'll take it. And that thing... That thing is awesome. I haven't shot it very much, to be honest. Yeah. But I, I need to. When we do our, our vintage gun shoot, uh, 
oh, yeah. one of these days I'll I'll bring that out because it's cool and that's one of those guns that's like I don't you know sometimes when you need cash you open up the gun safe and you're like okay what can go that's never been on the on the list yeah yeah because I can't replace it yeah you know not especially <laughs> not for what I got it for yeah so I don't know how many Glock 19s I've owned I. I was, when my oldest daughter graduated from high school, I was like, okay, graduation, I'm going to get her a, a laptop, you know? That's, you know, you're being an adult, you're moving out, you're going to school, all these things. And I was at this uh, place that did, like, uh, used Macs and refurbs and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking to the guy, and we're looking at some stuff, and, and he's like, inevitably they ask you, so what do you do for a living? And I'm like, oh, I make holsters for guns and stuff. Oh, really? He's like, I've been looking for a gun. I'm like, oh, yeah? What are you looking for? He's like, well, I have a, a family member or a relative or somebody who who's a cop, and he told me not to get anything but a Glock 19. So a Glock 19? So a Glock 19 is what he's looking for. And I'm like, well, I said, I've got a Glock 19. Do you want to trade? And he's like, really? And so we, like, go in the back room. I take it out of my holster and clear it, show it to him. I'm like, yeah, it's got night sights. It's, I said, I'll throw in a couple extra magazines. Everything is like, okay. I said, well, let me take it home and clean it for you. You know, because it was my everyday carry. So yeah, it's a little bit dirty. And stuff yeah. like that. And so, yeah, took it home, cleaned it up, brought it back, traded him straight across, told my daughter. I said, here, I got you this. Oh, that's great. So I had to trade my favorite gun for this. <laughs> oh, you did oh my gosh a week later i had another one <laughs> yeah and it was exactly like the one i traded yep. yeah. <laughs> so anyway that was cool those were fun stories thanks for sharing them yeah thanks us. for sharing and if you guys have other stories yeah. uh write in yeah. send them to us concealed taco dudes at gmail.com yep we're always interested in in stuff like that yeah that was a good time so thanks for sharing thanks for listening and subscribing and sharing the podcast with your friends yeah take care stay safe have fun be nice to people